Good afternoon. Welcome to the American Antiquarian Society's virtual book talk with Michael D'Alessandro. We are coming to you from the ancestral homelands of the Nipmuc tribal community who remain an active presence here in central Massachusetts. I'm Nan Wolverton, Vice President for Programs at the Society. Our mission here at the Society is to cultivate a deeper understanding of the American past, grounded in the primary sources that we have been collecting since 1812. In addition to welcoming researchers from around the world to use the collections, both physical and digital, we host programs like today's that feature the fruits of that research and provide insights into the past and its resonance for our own day. Today's program is sponsored by the Program in the History of the Book in American Culture. The virtual book talk series showcases authors of recently published scholarly monographs broadly related to book history and print culture. And the topic of today's talk intersects nicely with a week-long seminar titled On Stage, Spectacle in 19th Century America that took place just this past summer and was sponsored by the Society's Center for Historic American Visual Culture. I'm pleased to see that several of those participants are with us here today, so that's great. We thank everyone for joining us this afternoon, and as a nonprofit organization, we welcome any support that you can provide to help keep this work going, and thank you very much. Um, I am joined behind the scenes by my colleague, Amanda Kondek, Programs Coordinator, who will post links and relevant information into the chat throughout the program, um, but you will be asking your questions in the Q&A feature, so pay attention to that, and we'll get uh, to as many as possible of those to those of those after the talk. So you can put your questions in at any point while while Michael is presenting. And just remember that this program is being recorded um, and it will be available on our YouTube channel next week. So if you'd like to go back to it or uh, send other people to it, um, you'll have that option. And now it is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker. Michael D'Alessandro is Assistant Professor of English and Theater Studies at Duke University. He holds an MFA in dramatur tur Dramaturgy and Dramatic Criticism from Yale University and a PhD in American Studies from Boston University. Before arriving at Duke, Michael was a lecturer and Assistant Director of Studies of the History and Literature Program at Harvard University, and he was a, an a AAS short-term J. Last Fellow back in 2013. Michael's articles have appeared in or are forthcoming in American Literary History, J19, the Journal of 19th Century Americanists, Theater Survey, American Art, and the New England Quarterly. He will be speaking today about his book, Staged Readings, Contesting Class in Popular American Theater and Literature, 1835 to 75. And this has just come out from the University of Michigan Press. Michael. Well, thank you for that. <clears throat> thank you for that introduction, man. Uh, and uh, I, I want to express my gratitude today to uh, to American Antiquarian Society and to Nan and Amanda uh, for having me here. Uh, and I, I want to thank all of you for uh, for tuning into this on a Thursday afternoon. It's very much appreciated. Um, so what I thought I'd do today is uh, is do give a broad overview of the project. Uh, introduce the historical moment, um, some of the cultural issues at stake, and then spend most of my time uh, doing a deeper dive on my fourth chapter, which I began research on uh, many years ago uh, at, at American Antiquarian Society. So um, this book began as a way of trying to understand the overlaps between 19th century American theater and literature, and uh, the worlds were seemingly always colliding. For many years, theatrical montages kept popping up in novels. Uh, a third of the way through Moby Dick, Herman Melville briefly converts his novel into several dramatic dialogues, complete with stage directions, while novelist Stephen Crane and Theodore Dreiser wrote extended scenes portraying the era's melodrama stage. Just as importantly, literature permeated the theatrical world. Best-selling novels like Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, E.D.E.N. Southworth's *The Hidden Hand* and others served as source material for myriad popular stage adaptations in the century's second half. So I've long been interested in these connections between the two media, uh, and and so many of them involve overlooked lowbrow material 
including tawdry melodramas, uh, fear-mongering temperance speeches, and graphic blood and thunder fiction. Um, so as a, re as a researcher, <clears throat> I spent a lot of my time in the cultural muck, uh, which is actually quite enjoyable. Uh, but for this book, as I continued working through various archives, uh, my central questions became, what were the theater going and reading habits of various Americans throughout the 19th century? Why were there so many narrative and visual exchanges between 19th century drama and literature? Finally, how did these intersections between the media help it create and solidify different social classes? So accordingly, my project over the course of four chapters considers consumers not solely as readers or not solely as theater goers, but as both. As I build off of scholarship in print culture, theater history, and literary studies. Each chapter centers on a specific way in which 19th century theater infuses itself into literature or one in which literature infiltrates theater. In chapter one, I trace how sensation novelist George Lepard imports melodramatic stage tropes into his 1844 best-selling novel, The Quaker City, to galvanize a working class readership. My second chapter focuses on commercial temperance plays and examines how hack playwrights ripped, ripped off uh, ex-drunkard speeches and autobiographies to create new middle-class theater audiences. In the third chapter, I focus on how Dion Boussicot's popular stage melodrama, The Octoroon, recycles narrative tropes from blackface minstrelsy and middle, middle brow sentimental fiction. Uh, my fourth and final chapter, which I'm focusing on today, examines how these aesthetic exchanges function in the private realm, uh, specifically how parlor theatricals inspired by popular literature may have helped sharpen social class definitions. First, however, I wanna set the scene in terms of theater going, reading and class structures in 19th century America. As the century started, theater going was becoming an increasingly popular form of American leisure. Much of the earliest commercial theater was driven by working class audiences. While I want to avoid uh, absolute characterizations, we know many of these spectators uh, often were white men who were born on U.S. soil and labored in artisan stores, factories, and sweatshops, and unwound with long, raucous evenings at the playhouse after work. So by the 1830s and 40s, theaters in New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and other cities frequently played spectacle-heavy melodramas for these working-class audiences. Uh, like this uh, stage adaptation of Robert Montgomery Byrd's 1837 novel, Nick the Woods on the left, or The Water Queen on the right, uh, which touted one storm, two floods, 5,000 jets of real water and 6,000 jets of liquid fire. So uh, of course, these ads and playbills were often known puffery. And what even is liquid fire? Uh, but audiences still flock to the theaters to see how such stunts would play out in live time. In addition, the working classes also attended all sorts of related exhibitions, including panoramas of bloody battlefields and simulated volcano eruptions. Around the same time, the emergent middle classes were attempting to distance themselves from plebeian theater goers and stake out their own theatrical venues. And what do I mean by the middle classes? Well, uh, Walt Whitman defined his era's American middle classes as working salaried, uh, that is to say non-manual jobs. Uh, middle class men worked as businessmen, artisans and clerks. Some middle class women had vocations as writers or teachers, while many others were full-time mothers who participated in temperance and anti-slavery societies. When discussing the middle class, the contemporaneous press almost always indicated that this group was exclusively white, even though there was a small number of black Americans in the Northeast uh, who certainly reached the ostensible prerequisites for the social tier. Uh, and I explore that issue more in a different part of my book. But my main point here is that the burgeoning white middle classes in America often define themselves as what they were not. Amy Schrager Ling writes of, quote, a bounded middle class aware of itself as distinct from the poor in its interests its values and its styles of life. It wasn't just the poor either. The Northeastern middle classes overtly made efforts to distinguish themselves from immigrants, free black individuals and others that shared their public space. But this is really what I'm interested in, the styles of life that Lane mentions, because for the middle classes especially, these factors become just as crucial in signifying social status 
as any occupational or demographic categories. With public entertainment, the separation seemed easy enough. The middle classes simply didn't have to attend working class theaters or immigrant theaters. In the mid 1840s, Curiosity Museum owners like Moses Kimball in Boston, or later P.T. Barnum in New York, established what were called more lecture rooms, specifically for middle class audiences, including women and children. Uh, these museum rooms or these lecture rooms staged more reform melodramas, preaching about the evils of intemperance and gambling. These shows and various concerts, lecture series, and lyceum events allowed the middle classes to carve out an important and separate part of the public sphere for themselves. Uh, reading culture, however, wasn't so cut and dry. Literary magazine advisors carefully directed middle class readers towards novels by Sir Walter Scott, Nathaniel Hawthorne, Charlotte Bronte, Charles Dickens, among others. But there were problems here. Most prominently, any supposedly sophisticated middle class literature was by no means exclusive to them. Laborers famously read anything and everything, and not just lowbrow material. Archival diaries reveal lower class mill girls reading Dickens's The Old Curiosity Shop when it was reprinted in a Philadelphia newspaper, or cheap bootleg copies of works by Goethe, Hugo, and George Eliot circulating in rural American mining camps. Uh, obviously, this complicated the middle class's desires for an exclusive reading culture. Partly to reclaim their cultural ownership over these books, middle class readers engaged in communal closed door celebrations of literature. In many homes, children would memorize and recite poems by Scott, Longfellow, and Tennyson for their family members. Starting during the Civil War too, middle class women founded parlor reading clubs uh, in which members would discuss literary works and present research papers about famous authors to each other. In such socially exclusive settings, like-minded citizens could cultivate intimate friendships and reading communions. So these, uh, these histories of social distinction of how different uh, so classes used leisure forms like theater going and reading to create social distance are the ones that brought me several years ago to the American Antiquarian Society and particularly to my fourth chapter on parlor theatricals. So ultimately, uh, I argue that the white middle classes utilized private theater shows to bond over their shared values of reading and to define themselves as an exclusive social tier. But I also claim that their theatrical interpretations of famed literary scenes, at least as evident in the guidebook instructions, were narrow and inflected by participants' social and racial biases. While the middle class has certainly achieved some level of cohesion and definition, their performances finally reveal them as limited readers and as a fragile social collective. Okay, so what was parlor theater actually like? Um, some readers may know home theater scenes from famous works of literature like Jane Austen's uh, Mansfield Park, Louise May Alcott's Little Women, uh, and Edith Wharton's The House of Mirth. But there was a real life counterpart to these set pieces as private theatricals became a genuine mid, mid 19th century fad in the United States. They derived largely from 18th century aristocratic circles in, in Europe. But in the US at least they were an upper class and most commonly a middle class hobby. Uh, in the work of Kat Karen Haltunen, Melanie Dawson, uh, Eileen Curley and Mary Chapman, uh, crucially it has helped reconstruct some of these histories. Instructions for home amusement, amusements appeared first in middle brow periodicals like Godey's Ladies Book and Forrester's Playmate in the 1850s. Soon book anthologies of at-home dramatic entertainments appeared from 1855 to uh, 1875. At least 40 of these cheap texts were published with titles like amateur theatricals and fairy tale dramas for drawing room performances or how to amuse in an, an evening party as you can see in the middle picture here. Um, within these guys, guides, uh, authors suggest that readers construct in their own homes a proscenium frame up to eight feet high, as well as a stage platform by nailing together long planks of wood. A drop curtain could then be nailed to the top of the frame as seen in the left of this picture. For scenery, partici participants could paint their own diagrams or purchase pre-painted sets of gardens, woods, and cottage interiors from playtext publishers like Samuel French, uh, as you'll see on the right here. Guides provided instructions for various parlor games like charades, shadow pantomimes, and fairy tale tableau. 
Miniature players would be performed with makeshift special effects, uh, such as this illusion on the right of a woman being caught in a windstorm uh, with an assistant uh, who curiously looks like uh, Abe Lincoln hiding right out of view. Uh, so it might be easy to dismiss these as theoretical stagings by several publishers who just wanted to sell some books. But primary evidence actually confirms that these shows were performed uh, and that participants indeed followed guidebooks in terms of both stagecraft and social function. Writing to Godey's Ladies Book in 1860, New York City teenager Ella Moore discusses gathering with her cousins and friends for an evening of theatricals. Adhering to instructions, they fit a proscenium wood frame within a doorway dividing two parlors. Before the show, they draped a crimson curtain from the frame in imitation of public theaters. Uh, and during the performance, they dropped transparent blue gauze from it to create a ghostly effect. Another performer, Sarah Gould Putnam, who grew up to be a very respected artist uh, and was actually the subject of a terrific presentation by American Antiquarian Society's uh, Laura Wasowitz uh, not too long ago, admittedly derived from a higher class Boston family. As a 19 year old in 1870, uh, Putnam, or I'm sorry, as a 19 year old in 1870, uh, Putnam also recorded staging several theatricals. She and a troupe of friends performed in the family's back parlor while the entryway was filled with stools, high chairs, and even an ironing board for audience seating. She and her friends actually hand wrote playbills and constructed parlor theater tickets uh, as preserved in her archives at the Massachusetts Historical Society. Her family members and friends in turn showed up to theatricals with bouquets to bestow upon the performers after the show. Looking at examples like these, one of my primary contentions is that by imitating the commercial stage from its audience behavior to its proscenium, to its scenery, to its makeup and costumes, which were also available for sale, amateurs imported that venue's potential for social cohesion. Through their participation in parlor theater, performers appeared in front of an audience of family and friends, and in essence, could declare their membership in the middle class. Today, I really wanna hone in on one subgenre of home theater, tableau vivant, specifically because they most often attempted to replicate scenes from the era's popular literature. So 10 years ago, uh, I was sitting in the American Antiquarian Society and uh, Nan Wolverton here tapped me on the shoulder and told me I should look at this book here. So it's called Home Pastimes or Tableau Vivant. Uh, it's a 264 page guidebook with 100 Tableau Vivant uh, descriptions. And so I was immediately hooked. Um, at least 12 books devoted exclusively to home Tableau Vivants were published between 1855 in 1869. Um, and along with heads, you can see two others here, um, one by Sarah Annie Frost and one by Tony Denier. Um, so the theatrical tableau in its many manifestations dates to as early as the Middle Ages, uh, but the popular form of the tableau vivant, uh, at least as performed in mid 19th century American homes, followed a fairly strict formula according to the guidebooks. An evening's program would consist of 10 to 12 tableau, which would range from famous paintings to historical reenactments, uh, from fairy tale and folklore scenes to recognizable literary moments. In each tableau, performers would hold still poses for 30 seconds until the curtain descended and they would prepare for the next one. Most guide authors offered precise instructions about how performers should produce a scene, directing amateurs about how to position themselves physically, apply makeup, dress up props, and fix their expressions when acting. Tableau vivants were almost always wordless, but sometimes music played in the background and tinted lights often colored the scenes. Uh, again, a series of firsthand accounts, some with startling detail, indicate how these performances actually took place. For instance, teenager Ella Moore again reports performing three successive tableau vivants representing Joan of Arc's trial and execution. They were staged in the parlor of Moore's home and acting as Joan herself, Moore donned a tunic of imitation chain mail. For her first stage picture, uh, Moore describes freezing still with her hands shackled after her military capture. The second tableau involves Moore posing stoically after being sentenced to death. In the final scene, set just before the execution, uh, in, and in her words, quote, I knelt down, 
facing the audience, my hands crossed on my breast with my eyes raised like a duck in a thunderstorm as the curtain fell, end quote. Artworks remain central to private tableau vivant portrayals. Uh, for instance, guidebook authors suggest scenes from Paul Delaroche's oil portrait of Napoleon at St. Helena or artist Constant Meyer's painting of a wounded Union soldier. But as I've said, the reason I'm most interested in this subgenre is because of the bonds that were intended to fortify around shared literary tastes. One guidebook offers scenes from Sir Walter Scott's novels, Ivanhoe, Woodstock, and The Heart of Midlothian. Another suggests a famous fortune-telling scene from Oliver Goldsmith's The Vicar of Wakefield, or well-known moments from Shakespeare's dramas, popular both on stage and page, including King Lear wandering in the storm or Hamlet encountering his father's ghost. So for tableau vivants to work effectively, audiences had to instantly recognize the literary scene, setting off a communal moment of sudden recognition among spectators. For the middle classes in particular, staging a successful program of tableau vivants depended upon a group of participants already conversant in art or literature, pre-approved by cultural arbiters. In this sense, then, the tableau vivants retained special potential in bonding those performing and those viewing the theatrical shows. At a time when the middle classes often define themselves via their knowledge of books, such live representations uh, allowed them to interact with the texts in ways that the working classes, immigrants, and free black individuals, among others, uh, many of whom lacked the time and the privileged parlor venues, could not. Parlor theatricals could foster a middle class community that grew more concrete and more exclusive through collaborative engagement with popular texts. Uh, today, I, I specifically want to show how this process worked uh, and some of the problems that may have emerged, particularly regarding the intersections of class and race uh, through two case studies of tableau based on literature. So, uh, so first, I'm going to look at uh, tableau vivant adaptations of, Uncle, of Harry Beecher Stowe's Uncle Tom's Cabin. Uh, as many of you may know, Stowe's 1852 novel uh, was a blockbuster in the marketplace, selling 300,000 copies in its first year, unheard of for an American novel during this period. However, it's been estimated that for every one reader of Uncle Tom's Cabin, there were 50 spectators for the public theatrical productions. The novel spawned at least nine different theatrical adaptations in the 1850s alone, including most prominently George Aiken's 1852 version bring the narrative to, entire, to the entire spectrum of theater going audiences. As such, many of the boundaries between social classes, usually reinforced by separate playhouses by this point, broke down uh, and mixed social crowds often watched the public productions together. Primary reviews of Tom shows reveal working class audiences uh, cheering and crying, uh, while the adjacent middle class audiences and critics sneered at the gallery boys' rowdy reactions. Hence, there was sometimes um, a social battle for Uncle Tom's Cabin, uh, who the text belonged to and how, it should be <clears throat> and how it should be remembered and enacted. So my argument here is that parlor tableau vivants allowed the middle classes to perform a sanitized version of the novel that theoretically at least could allow them to affirm their cultural, cultural ownership over the book. Through these home adaptations of a famed literary text, then the middle classes would be able to further define themselves as a distinct social collective. The home tableau vivants of Uncle Tom's Cabin exclusively depicted the novel's domestic scenes set at the St. Clair's plantation and their lake villa. The most common Uncle Tom tableau restaged a famous picture from Stowe's book, Little Eva reading the Bible to Uncle Tom in the arbor. Illustrator Hammett Billings' engraving of the scene seen in this slide here was one of only six in publisher John Jowett's first edition of Stowe's novel uh, and became the text's most recognizable image. The picture inspired uh, paintings, fine art prints, sheet music covers, needlework patterns, and porcelain figurines uh, as seen here. In the 1860s alone, at least four separate 18, uh, <clears throat> at least four separate theatrical guidebooks outline similar tableau vivants of Little Eva reading the Bible to Uncle Tom. The return again and again to this image 
reveals how the middle classes wish to visualize Stowe's novel as reflective of their own white self-perceived genteel values. As I've noted, the commercial adaptations often gain notoriety for the sensation scenes, including most prominently this one, portraying Eliza Harris escaping slavery and crossing the ice with little Harry that were used in theater ads and were particularly popular among working class crowds. In contrast, the middle class's home tableau vivant discarded this sensationalism for the docile scene of garden reading. Of course, a small intimate scene like this one was much easier from an amateur staging perspective. But I'd also maintain that there was something vital thematically about the arbor reading scene. One guide pres prescribes a precise body position for Tom. Quote, Uncle Tom is seated on one side of the seat, his legs crossed, body bent forward slightly, hands placed on his knees, his head turned toward Eva, and eyes fixed on the Bible with an expression of pleasure and earnestness, end quote. The tableau exhibits Tom's body as controlled and his mannerism subdued. Divorced from the novel's larger narrative, he appears as another open-eyed Bible reader, just like the middle-class parlor dwellers themselves. Hence, by pausing Uncle Tom's cabin on this moment, the middle classes could reduce the book to a single image that symbolized their, symbolized their supposedly cultivated reception, the way that they wanted to visualize the novel. Moreover, through this enactment, the middle classes could reclaim the text, or at least this part of it, from the competing populations that admired Stowe's book. Again, the scene contrasts sharply with those frequently advertised in the commercial plays that so often highlighted the exposed, commoditized black body, such as the disconcerting auction scene and Simon Legree's whippings of Tom. And here is a juxtaposition between the commercial theater poster on the left and an illustration from a 1905 children's book edition on the right that most closely simulates the tableau description. Of course, the commercial set pieces centered on violence also had their own troubles, uh, even in the productions that prompted white viewers to empathize with Tom's plight, such scenes of physical suffering risked, as Saidiya Hartman has put it, quote, fixing and naturalizing this condition of pained embodiment, end quote. But denying that such actualities existed, which the tableau vivant seemed to do, was alarming in a different way. As a frozen moment, the Arbor Tableau prompts participants to reclaim Tom's body as secure and untouched from the brutality surrounding him. This isolated, ultimately false version of the novel, one defined by bucolic placidity and ignoring the political and graphic corporeal realities of chattel slavery, was the one that the middle classes chose to remember and embody. The problems only magnify when we take into account that guidebooks explicitly directed Uncle Tom performers to act in blackface makeup. One guidebook reads, quote, color of the exposed parts of the body black, the lips red, end quote. Another manual demands a curly haired wig and specifies, quote, your hands must be colored uh, with burnt cork mixed with water and rubbed on until it assumes the required shade, end quote. In fact, the back pages of parlor guides sold wig and makeup kits with burnt cork and rouge specifically for this purpose. Applying blackface at home was not only encouraged, but expected. So as much as the white middle class were trying to cohere around a specific discrete interpretation of Stowe's text, they seemingly undermined themselves through the pragmatics of their performances. The blackface spectacle in and of itself which suggested race could be taken on and off at will, exposed to subtextual racist and xenophobic ideas threading through many white middle-class circles in the Northeast. Furthermore, it ironically realigned the middle classes with many of the lowbrow theatrical forms like minstrelsy and crude melodrama from which they were trying to separate themselves through parlor theater. The public Tom shows whether straight adaptations or minstrel spin-offs were based in a blackface performance mode that summoned, again in Hartman's words, a quote, derision, ridicule, and violence that ultimately restored the racial terms of social order, end quote. Ultimately, this was the polluted theatrical legacy that potentially made its way into white middle-class parlors. Thus, the parlor tableau vivants were indeed likely helping the middle classes to distance and define themselves 
but not always in the ways they anticipated. These Uncle Tom's cabin tableau were not as many parlor theatricals sometimes were built, innocuous entertainments. Neither did they really amount to a narrative about genuine literary appreciation or interpretation. Rather, they became quite problematically transparent narratives about white middle-class anxiety and reinforcement. Uh, Uncle Tom's Cabin, though, was hardly the only text that middle-class amateurs may have performed to solidify their social bonds. Central among the other worthwhile case studies is a series of tableau vivants based loosely on French author Charles Perez uh, in 1697 fairy tale Bluebeard. The first most prominent uh, version of the Bluebeard Tableau was published in 1868 in Harper's Bazaar magazine, notably a middle-class publication at the time. And the illustrator of the piece was none other than Winslow Homer. So for those unfamiliar, uh, the Bluebeard narrative usually follows a young woman, often named Fatima, sometimes not, uh, after her marriage to a rich, frequently dark-skinned nobleman known as Bluebeard, whose previous seven wives have all disappeared. Uh, Bluebeard has, of course, murdered them uh, and placed their heads hanging in a secret closet, a room that has piqued Fatima's interest. The Harper's tableau pick up at the climax of Fatima's curiosity, and it's a two tableau series. And let me walk you through the instructions here. Um, so in the first tableau on the top, uh, Fatima holds the key in her hand, and, and uh, what a key it is, uh, uh, having just unlocked and opened the door of Bluebeard's closet. Uh, unseen behind her, Bluebeard is grasping his scimitar and watching Fatima enter. After this tableau was enacted, the curtain would descend and the performance would break for several moments. Then the curtain would raise on the second tableau seen on the bottom, which reveals the heads of the seven young women suspended by, by the hair from the ceiling. To achieve this effect, Homer includes a third drawing uh, seen on the right here, uh, displaying how the performers playing the wives must stick only their heads uh, through a piece of white curtain and tie their hair to a rope above. Most middle-class readers would have known the Bluebeard tale. Like Uncle Tom's Cabin, Bluebeard was a popular work in the public domain. Besides Perez's version, uh, dozens of adaptations followed in other languages, including most famously one uh, by the Brothers Grimm. Chapbooks, which were short, self-contained, sometimes crudely illustrated publications for children, uh, as seen in the McLaughlin Brothers edition in the center picture here, circulated widely in the US. Public theater also again informed how consumers interpreted the work. English writers uh, George Coleman and Michael Kelly penned their 1798 musical melodrama, Bluebeard or Female Curiosity, which was largely responsible for Easternizing the characters. Mid-19th century theaters in New York and Boston staged Bluebeard as a straight melodrama, uh, an equestrian drama, even a children's show. So whether on page or stage, the tale was so well known in middle-class circles that the Ladies' Repository magazine asked its decorous readers in 1855, quote, what child has not shuddered at the very name of old Bluebeard, end quote. As with the Uncle Tom's Cabin tableau vivant, the ostensible purpose of the Bluebeard staging is seemingly to spark audience members' mutual recognition to catalyze their social bonding over a shared literary taste. But unlike the Uncle Tom's Cabin example, the Bluebeard Tableau is not some genteel stolen moment from the story, nor does it whitewash the racial elements. Uh, rather, the violence in the exoticism of the Bluebeard tale are central to its purpose as a tableau vivant. Whether they were willing to admit it or not, the real reason uh, Bluebeard may have appealed to the white middle classes was, was not its ubiquity in middle class reading circles, nor its fundamental dramaturgy, but rather the tale's blatant Orientalism. While some literary and theatrical versions of Bluebeard minimize the Eastern setting and Bluebeard's otherness, uh, Homer's illustration amplifies these elements. Going back and close reading the tableau now, uh, the crescent moons on Bluebeard's shirt, combined with the circles on the wall behind him, established, established Bluebeard as literally part of the Eastern scenery. At the same time, he remains a dangerous agent. He's heavily bearded, but turbaned, uh, wearing curled shoes and long silks, and grasps, grasps a curved scimitar. The 
tabloid description finds him, quote, gloating over the success of his coming stratagem, which is to add another to the list of his disobedient victims, end quote. Bluebeard's perpetual threat of violence combined with his appearance mark him as a resolutely foreign figure within the protected middle-class parlor. Whereas the guidebook authors effectively remake Tom, Uncle Tom, as a white man in silhouette, here Bluebeard's very exoticism cannot be covered. Homer takes special care to present him as distinctly other. His Bluebeard is old, uh, unkempt, menacing, and unambiguously non-white. Brown makeup was again expected to add to the effects. Bluebeard's alien appearance that gave uh, white middle-class audiences the opportunity to define themselves adversarially to the swarthy villain. So if there was a polar opposite to the white prim parlor theater audiences, Bluebeard was it. The second tableau in the Harper sequence only underlines these racial dichotomies. The seven heads appear in a single row against a white background. Some eyes appear downcast, uh, others, oops, yeah, uh, some eyes appear downcast, others are shaded dark with makeup. Another pair stares into the sky, revealing a blank whiteness. If staged correctly, the scene could pull off a genuine shock, not just from the morbid nature of the tableau, but also from the premeditated racial display as well. Although the women are of Eastern origin in, in many 19th century versions and are especially designated as such in the Harper's text here, the women appear unmistakably white in Homer's picture, whiter even than the curtain against which their heads are staged. The tableau clearly defines this whiteness against the blackness or brownness or blueness of Bluebeard himself. It also pushes viewers into a visual alignment with Fatima, who pictured with pale skin and white robe serves as a central white figure. Thus, despite all characters from, Blue, from Bluebeard to Fatima to the dead wives, technically sharing the same non-white ethnicity, the tableau instructions insist on presenting a marked contrast of skin color. Ultimately, the tableau exposes both the reader's misunderstandings of racial difference and their disconcerting reassertions of white dominance. These features are further exaggerated in various knockoffs of the tableau illustration and description. Uh, one adaptation seen here and now coming back uh, full circle to the, my book cover image, inaugurated uh, a supplementary section for the story paper, Frank Leslie's Chimney Corner. It was published in 1869, a year after the original Harper's article. In this Chimney Corner version, Bluebeard is younger, but with significantly darker skin hues, more crumpled in on himself and holding the knife next to his face, closer to his attempted killing of Fatima. Two suspended heads in the, uh, two suspended heads in the background propel the scene's terror beyond Homer's version and Harper's. Uh, it, <clears throat> the violence and the racial threat are more imminent this time around. Meanwhile, the well-dressed white spectators whispering to each other uh, only underscore the anticipated class and race-based reception. So the Bluebeard Tableau of Avance reveal the white middle classes potentially bonding again uh, around their mutual literary appreciation, but their shared qualities of whiteness likely carried just as much weight. And by the postbellum era, that whiteness was becoming fundamental to middle-class definitions in the Northeast. Archives reveal the Bluebeard Tableau continued to be performed mainly among the elevated classes uh, for decades after the Harper's article first appeared, such as here at Beloit College circa 1905. For these women, the sheer theatrical novelty, tying their hair to the wall, seeing friends pose as disembodied heads, certainly would have had its own social value. But beneath all this fun and trickery, ran deep-seated histories of readers and spectators, of privilege and power, of class and of color. So to wrap up, you know, I want to assert that it made sense that guidebook authors saw parlor theatricals and more specifically literary tableau vivants as a way to consolidate the white middle classes. Um, it also seems true that guidebook author or guidebook readers often use these private enactments to project a sense of themselves as a distinctive social class. But what I've also tried to emphasize, and this may become more 
apparent in the context of the other case studies in my book um, are the missteps and imperfections in this process of self-motivated class delineation. Theatrical guidebooks encourage amateurs to hear around shared scenes of literary value, but if that ever faltered, to fall back on more deep-seated beliefs of social and racial distinction. Now, in other venues, these intersections between theater, uh, literature, and class definition played out differently. Uh, as I show elsewhere in the project, uh, the nativist white working classes define themselves against immigrants through consuming apocalyptic imagery that traveled from real life street riots to the theatrical stage to best selling novels. Uh, meanwhile, America's old money upper classes often imported European theatrical and literary works to distinguish themselves from the emergent middle classes. Um, of course, many economic and social variables helped create. Uh, distinct social tiers in America, and they're a critical part of my story too. Um, but in examining the oft overlooked nexus of theater and literature, when narratives were migrating from one medium to the other, uh, I hope that we can continue to discover how culture made class in 19th century America. Uh, thank you. Wow, thank you. What a fantastic and uh, dare I say dramatic uh, presentation. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty great. I love that you've been spending time in the cultural muck to get at all of this. This is fantastic. Right, uh, yeah. So we have um, about 20 minutes for questions, which is great. So those of you who have questions, please put them in the Q&A. Um, and while folks are doing that, um, we have some coming in, but let me just ask very quickly if I could, Mike, um, uh, so, so many of us have spent some time either, you know, at a very young age doing things with theater, whether it's, uh, in the audience or, or on stage. I'm curious to know if, if you came to, uh, to this topic in part because of your own interest in theater at a young age, but more particularly, um, how you came to this project and the, at the, the crossroads between theater yeah. and literature. Yeah. Um, no, I have, I have very little background in the theater. Um. I tried out for a play in third grade and uh, did not get the part. And uh, so that was the beginning and the end of my theatrical career. But, um, but uh, I, you know, I was doing my master's work, but I'm very interested in the theater and in, in reading plays, um, in watching plays. I was doing my uh, master's degree at Yale in dramaturgy uh, uh, about 17 years, 17, 18 years ago now. And I got really, interested in reading temperance dramas um, and uh, temperance melodramas, which I found, um, you know, both affecting and also sort of hilarious. And so I, I made this project where I had to read every temperance play that I could get my hands on from the 19th century. Um, and then I went and got a degree in American studies. And as I was reading a lot of um, these sensation novels that I was referring to, uh, I started noticing sort of these tropes that were traveling from the stage to the page and back again. Uh, and, uh, you know, I, I started no like just asking myself, well, like, was everybody in America in the 1840s, like some wandering drunkard or, you know, or, or, or are the, you know, or were writers ripping each other off and why would they be ripping each other off? And then once I started noticing those tropes, the, you know, the whole project sort of opened up in a way because I started noticing again, this apocalyptic imagery that was moving between the media. I was noticing um, tropes from sentimental fiction that was that were appearing in, um, you know, in stage plays that I was reading. Uh, you know, and finally, I think it just got me to thinking, well, what was it like to be a consumer in 19th century America where you would travel from the theater to the parlor to um, to reading groups to the Lyceum, and I think um, that was really the impetus for this project was trying to put myself in the shoes of you know a more holistic consumer. Um, so so that's that's kind of where it began and you know where it's where it's uh, you know where it's grown. Yeah, from. great, thank you. Um, well, let me start getting to some questions here. Um, Cheryl Thurber is asking, um, and this gets to something you, you mentioned at the end that there, you know, the other case studies, the other parts of the book. So this is great. Um, Cheryl is interested in how minstrel shows fit into your book, particularly as it changed uh, over time. Yeah. So um, in my third chapter, I talk about um, uh, I talk about the Octoroon, um, which is a very popular melodrama by Dion Boussacot. It's in a lot of anthologies right now. 
um, still. And, um, uh, you know, and I talk about how he was capitalizing on tropes that were in the sentimental novel, but also among, you know, in the, on the blackface stage and sort of reselling it as um, something genuine, um, as, as something real. Uh, and while when what he was really doing was really capitalizing on um, a middle class audience that was already used to these tropes um, in a different context in these standalone minstrel shows. And so um, when within the context of a melodrama that there was this sense of recognition that would, um, again, I think, help those processes of, of social uh, of social cohesion. So, so, I mean, that's the, that's the like thumbnail version uh, of that answer. Um, but also, uh, you know, in after, I mean, I do that, that I've, I do think that minstrelsy plays into it. These middle-class, um, uh, you know, theoretically these middle-class amateur performers are summoning ghosts of the minstrel stage in their parlors. And, um, and I think, again, it's, they're capitalizing on this, um, this sort of like communal experiential memory that they all have of going to minstrel shows, um, or that some of them have at least of going to minstrel shows. Um, and, and so, and I mean, this is incredibly problematic, this practice, but it, it seems like it was, it, it does seem like it was, it was taking place. So, um, so those are the two sort of parts where I, where I break down minstrel C. Um, the most, um, and uh, the arguments in the book are a little more complicated, but that's that's what I would say for now. Great, great, thank you. Um, here's a question from Bethany Hughes, who was actually one of our guest faculty for the for the uh, summer seminar this year. So it's great to have her here. Um, Bethany says, today you focus on the construction of the middle class through participation in the literary and theater culture. Could you speak briefly to how these dynamics or activities were playing out? in lower class and elite circles, do you find similarities or differences or resonances among the various class formations? Yeah, um, yes, uh, that's a great question. And um, it's uh, it's a large question. Um, and uh, I can I, I talk about this in um, the introduction and um, uh, of my book and as well as my first chapter. Um, what I would say is that, um, the idea of like the working classes as a as a group or the laboring classes, um, they, those words were being used in periodicals and magazines. Um, I think as early as the eighteen twenties, um, and on a regular basis. And so um, there was a sense that everybody knew who the laborers were um, in uh, during that period. Um, although that changed with the Panic of eighteen thirty seven, but but there was a um, there was more of a, you know, I, I hesitate to use this phrase, but there was more of a class consciousness among the working classes in the early part of the century. Um, whereas the middle classes were so precarious in a way that they they were using, um, that they used uh, other classes and other populations to de define themselves um, against. Um, but the but in terms of the working classes, uh, my, my argument in my first chapter is that uh, a lot of this apocalyptic imagery uh, uh, was being circulated among working class crowds from the page to the stage and like an author like George Lepard, uh, who I break down in that first chapter, he's actually recognizing the imagery that's the riot imagery the, and the stage imagery that is um, that is popular amongst working classes and importing that into his novel to actually recruit a cohesion um, and a class consciousness among his working class readers who he explicitly, um, who he explicitly talked about. The upper class, so that's my example for the working class. The upper class is, um, you know, they, they tried to keep their distance a little bit more. Um, uh, you know, they, they instituted, for instance, like 150 wealthy New Yorkers instituted um, or, or, uh, or they founded the Astor uh, Place Opera House um, in uh, 1847, I think, um, so that they could bring more European operas in. Um, certainly the ticket prices for those theaters just kind of shut everybody out. Um, but of course, there was an Astor Place uh, riot um, uh, in uh, the next year, year and a half later. Um, you know, that actually sort of um, brought those those class uh, conflicts into 
you know, into full view. So, um, but, uh, but so, so it looked a little bit, depending on the class, it looked a little bit different. Um, uh, I think one of the reasons I'm so interested in the middle classes though, are because they're so, um, they're just so unsteady at this point. And so like fundamentally, at least according to my research, fundamentally insecure. Great. Uh, thanks. So here's a question from Melanie Hernandez, uh, another former fellow. Um, uh, Melanie says, for clarification, do you see the cohesion of the middle class as an outcome of publishers trying to create a consumer class based on class and racial identity? Or do you see an intentional desire to create racial and class identity as a primary driving force for other possibly political ends? Uh, the former. So I, I do. Um, so what I what I think is happening is that publishers, culture, um, theater producers, uh, other cultural arbiters, booksellers are um, uh, are trying to um, create different sort of class communities um, through the uh, through creating specific genres of, of uh, genres following genres of books, but followings of uh, books and theatrical shows. It's a little bit more apparent in theater, as I was talking about with um, uh, Barnum and Moses Kimball, who explicitly were trying to create a sort of consumer community. It's not necessarily, um, uh, it's not always about po uh, uh, political ends. Um, it's, I mean, it's actually, quite frankly, largely about commercial ends. Um, but, um, but certainly when you get into the working, the creation of the working class consumer groups, sometimes there it does get, um, uh, you know, slightly more political. But as chapters two, three, and four in my book sort of outline that middle class uh, consciousness and the, the creation of the middle class is much, much more for, um, is for commercial reasons. Right. Thanks, and uh, here's a question from Lauren Hughes, a VP for Collections here and also Curative Graphic Arts. Um, Lauren is curious about the audiences portrayed in the images that you showed of the tableau of Bluebeard and Uncle Tom. The images seem to indicate how much the audience was participating or not, as on your cover image, in the tableau experience. Did the guides offer tips for the performers uh, for how to deal with audience members? Yeah, that's great. Uh, yeah, I mean, I. You know, there's so many like fun anecdotes. Um, you know, reading about these parlor theatricals. There's, there's. I mean, you know, it was such a makeshift operation, right? So like, like when people are sitting on ironing boards for these shows, like those ironing boards are frequently breaking down, uh, or, um, <laughs> or people forget their lines. Um, and actually, if you read, um, you know, this is in my book too, but like. If you read um, the performance of the melodrama in Little Women that the girls are performing in the first, uh, you know, for, in the first uh, couple chapters, um, everything seems to go wrong in that performance. Uh, and and Joe Marsh is always like, well, let's, let's just soldier on. Like, we're, like we gotta we gotta act through it. Um, there aren't a lot of tips about audiences. Um, and to Lauren's question here, I mean, one of the fascinating things about this image on my cover is, uh, it, for me, is how. Uh, is how bored um, the audience looks. <laughs> like, I don't really know what that's, uh, I don't really know what that's all about. I mean, like there's heads hanging on a wall. So you, you know, you'd think it would be a little bit more, a, a little bit more entertaining, um, but certainly uh, maybe it underscores the idea that they're the middle classes are some, some types of like gossipers. Um, but but uh, in short, no, there's not a lot of advice in, in, in terms of audiences, but, uh, but I, I am, there are great anecdotes about how um, about how these things uh, played out in real life. Right. Thank you. Um, yeah, I I love the way you um, show how the the participants in these tableau vivants act as editors of literary texts. Yeah. It's just fascinating. It's great yeah. discussion and 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 how they as then how the audiences understood it. Yeah. Um, Let's see, Sarah Ruffin Robbins is asking, she's curious about what kinds of migrations you're seeing going on today via paths such as TV and film adaptation. Yeah, so uh, again, another really good question. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, it's tougher today because 
I mean, the media scape is just so wild. Uh, but, you know, one thing I, uh, you know, I'd say is that I think I have this anecdote in my book, which is to say that um, something like I like I looked at all the films in 2019, like the top 20 films, best, you know, highest grossing films. And 17 of them were, you know, either something like either a sequel or something that was like imported from a comic book or um, uh, or, uh, you know, part of some sort of intellectual property. And so I'm not saying anything here that's particularly revelatory, but I am interested in how those narratives uh, move between those spaces and, uh, you know, and why that's like a safe um, financial bet uh, for studios. Uh, and I'm, I'm really interested in the way that, um, like, I think they, they put on To Kill a Mockingbird on stage a few years ago, uh, Aaron Sorkin uh, put it on and, and he, he took the novel and, you know, put it on. And it's like, you know, already there, there's an audience, there's a built in audience for that because everybody had to read that book in high school um, and, you know, they want to revisit it. So I'm, 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 I'm super interested in those migrations. I don't like have a, um, a great point about it, but um, I am interested in the idea of communion around these properties though. And the idea of like viewing parties or, um, or like online forums that allow you, allow that social cohesion to take place. Now it's not, in terms of class, and uh, you know, as much anymore, um, but uh, but certainly in terms of fandom, um, uh, you know, some of the those same dyna dynamics are playing out, um, you know, really across America, really across the world. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for that question. Uh, we're getting down to the wire here, but uh, I think we have time for one more question anyway. And just a note that came in early on from Sheila Brenner that she recalls the movie uh, in the movie Music Man that had uh, some of these tableaus by some of the ladies of the town. That does sound familiar. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Tim Helwig is asking, uh, he's saying he hasn't read the book and wondering if you could talk yeah. a little bit about uh, Lepard's integration of theatricality into works like the, uh, the Quaker City and how his strategies appeal to the working classes um, or may have appealed to working classes differently from the ways the middle class was consolidating itself through theater. Yes. Um, okay. Uh, so uh, that's it's a it's a big question. I'm trying to I'm, yeah. I can summarize the argument from my first chapter in uh, about ninety. <laughs> um, so um, uh, what I would um, in the Quaker City, um, Lepard is um, capitalizing on this sort of um, theatrical landscape that is uh, has a lot of those sort of like water queen like climaxes where uh, you know there are there's liquid fire, there are eruption, there are volcano eruptions, there are there are um, columns falling on people's heads during earthquakes, and um, and I think he's playing to these nativist, uh, he's playing to these nativist working classes and trying to create in that private experience of reading a sense of sort of a virtual community so that when you're reading the book of Quaker City, you know, if you're a laborer, theoretically, and you're reading the book of Quaker City, that um, the idea of seeing these types of simulated scenes, whether it was on the stage, whether it was during a street riot, um, that it activates something in you. It activates this that uh, that previous experience of communion. Um, so there's something um, there's something about that experiential like sense memory that's reproduced in the private reading experience. Um, and uh, in terms of the you know and how that differs from the middle class. I mean, I'm not sure it does fundamentally change um, the way. I'm not sure it's fundamentally different from the ways that the middle classes were also sort of summoning previous experiences as theater goers or as, or, or as readers. Um, but, you know, in terms of that earlier question, I think like Lepard, ha, you know, who's a very political writer, um, you know, had a, you know, had much more of a, a, an agenda, um, or at least a social political agenda, um, when, whereas the middle class consolidating itself through theater, um, uh, as I as I said earlier, people like Moses Kimball, people like P.T. Barnum, they were trying to bring these um, 
these people together for sort of commercial commercial gain. Um, but um, I, I really thank uh, Tim for that, Tim Howard for that question. Uh, his discovery of the Quaker City Playbill um, uh, was one of the inspiring uh, 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 inspiring moments for me as I uh, as I wrote that chapter. So I I really appreciate that. Oh, that's great. Um, and just a quick follow up. Um, that someone, an anonymous attendee is asking about whether audiences were defining themselves as middle class rather than not those awful lower class people. <laughs> I fear that might be a quick, quick answer. <laughs> yeah, quick, quick answer. Um, uh, so the, the, the terms middling class and middle class were being used um, in popular publications by the 1840s, 1850s, so about 20 or 30 years um, later. However, they were frequently put in. Uh, uh, they were frequently put in conversation with um, uh, laboring classes, the laborers, uh, the working class, um, and so th there was a sense that maybe they could define themselves independently. But it also, I mean, from everything I've read, that tension, even whether you know textual or subtextual, with the lower classes um, or or immigrants or uh, black populations you know, was always there. Yeah, yeah. Well, um, thanks. And I, I will just let, you know, Julie Ping has one one final question. This is a big question, so you don't have to <laughs> answer it other than you don't have time to get into it. But um, uh, she loved your ideas. She knows that you're focusing on 19th century, but wondering if you have any uh, thoughts on how, it, uh, broader insights on how it evolves into the early 20th century. Do you want to address? address uh, just very Briefly, for yeah, um, uh, let's Brian, uh, yeah, hi Julie. Um, uh, so, um, what I would say is, uh, this is actually part of the um, part of my work now, um, and I'm looking into this, uh, you know, a little bit in terms of um, uh, what I would say, and maybe this is just like a like a morsel um, for a later conversation with Julie or with anybody, um, is really the advent of silent film and the ways that um, some of these theatrical tableau um, uh, are actually working their ways into silent film and how if you only have eight minutes to tell the story of Uncle Tom's Cabin, you can only, you can only do it through tableau. And then of course, there's venues like the Nickelodeon theaters um, that certainly invited, uh, you know, were invited to certain social classes, um, uh, uh, you know, and made made some of those viewings more democratic than they would be um, in previous eras. But um, uh, but uh, anyway, that's great. Thank you all for uh, these wonderful questions, and again well, for spending a few a great, hours with me. Great today. question to 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 end on, actually, yeah. as we as we look ahead how it, it impacts the early twentieth century. Uh, Michael, thank you so much. This has been really terrific. Um, and thank you to everyone who attended today. Let me just take a second to give you um, a notice about some upcoming programs, including next Tuesday, November 1st, when we'll be talking um, with Denise Gigante about her book, uh, Book Madness. That will be at 7 p.m. Uh, virtual presentation. Um, on November, November 10, we'll have a hybrid program that is in person in Andrew Quarian Hall, but also um, a, a virtual option with David Godin. We'll be talking about five decades in the life of an independent publisher. And then our next in this book talk series uh, will be on November 17th, um, a, a talk by Marcy Dinius on her new book, The Textual Effects of David Walker's Appeal, Print-Based Activism, um, his slavery, uh, racism, and uh, discrimination, 1829 to 1851. So that will be another great um, talk in this book talk series. So again, thank you, Michael. Thank, thank you. you.